Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Going to get in our time machine to 1991, one of the biggest movies of all time, and Marvel Comics was there to adapt it. Uh, before we dive into T2, let's look at Red Room. Yes, sir. Red Room is going to be available beginning uh, May 2021. Uh, two issues are available for pre-order as we speak. You can get to the Fantagraphics uh, website to reserve your copy today through the link tree in the description below. But this is going to be a comic that's in proper comic shop. So let your store know that you want copies of Red Room. Get it put into your subscriber box, your pool list. It's going to come out reliably every uh, every month. I got uh, nearly six issues uh, done completely. And uh, they're all singular too. So complete stories in each issue. Very important to me. I love all the lettering on the covers. It reminds me of like Silver Age totally. uh, Marvel books or whatever, and which makes it, s but also so inappropriate with that comparison. <laughs> you, you know what I like on this one? It's like introducing Poker Face with an arrow. Like, <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> the, you know, this comes from our 1963 coverage. Like that was in my mind and everything. That's Any, fun. Anyhow, uh, patreon.com slash edpiscor is where you can uh, read the Red Room comics ahead of time. Uh, so good that car screeching by. Yeah, yeah thanks, man. This is uh, the f the first issue, and as you can see, these these uh, bootlegs that were sent to us were um, constructed from the files on the Patreon. So you're not getting, you know, some 72 DPI, super small, fuzzy comics on there, man. High quality images. We've seen a few of these bootlegs, and I got to tell you, man, tip tip of the cap to this guy. This yeah. is a really nice addition that he put together. I'm, Very cool. I'm stoked. I I, I kind of hope he sends me one for every <laughs> issue, man, just so that I could like check my work. It, it looks very nice. What you got, Jimmy? I am on Patreon as well, patreon.com slash jimrug, where I post some of my out-of-print zines and mini-comics. If you follow the channel, you've seen some videos of me making some of these things. I love making them, but in some cases, they're in editions as low as 40, and so you can actually download these when you join my Patreon as uh, PDFs, high-res PDFs, that you can then keep up with everything that I am doing in that regard. I also post a lot of original art and process stuff. I'm doing a series right now comparing two Street Angel comics that are the same story, but that I drew like three years apart, uh, and you know, talking about what the differences are between those and, and why I made those differences. So. You can, uh, if you like process, you can find all of that at patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. But we're here today, Ed, to talk about, uh, speaking of process, to talk about some interesting production uh, choices by Marvel Comics in regards to their Terminator 2 adaptations. These are 1991, so height of speculator market. Uh, comics were selling in big numbers, and T2 was doing huge numbers at the at the box office. Kind of a different kind of movie at that time in terms of giant budget and also just mass media onslaught as this is a, a new type of summer blockbuster movie. Marvel doing business, you know, getting, getting their cut of it in the comics market. So the first thing we have is uh, it was a three-issue regular, you know, comic book series. This is something you could have found on the newsstands, I'm sure, uh, although these look like direct market releases. But this popular was, format, one dollar an issue. This was polybagged, if I remember correctly. So the polybag stuff might have the barcode uh, indicative yeah. of the newsstand on the polybag. So that could be the uh, the way this got on my radar was it's Klaus Jansen is doing your line work, and we'll be inside of these in a second. But man, I love this image. You know, like Klaus Jansen is amazing. He's doing pencil and ink, but not color on this, and. Uh, you pointed out this is the newsstand magazine issue of this. So this collects all three issues in black and white, which is kind of cool. You know, part of my attraction to that is I want to see Klaus Jansen's artwork up close and personal. Uh, the third edition is like a perfect bound collection of everything on nicer paper. And uh, I'm going to try my best to kind of compare some of these things as we go through. But the first standout piece is you'll see the art doesn't go to the edge of the pages. That's a pretty weird production choice. Yeah, does it work that way? It does. In the regular series, it's the same deal. You can see, like, it looks like this stuff should bleed. You right. know, it's not a clean edge. If you want a clean edge, you outline your panel on all four sides. The fact that it's not outlined makes me think that's designed to bleed off the page. Yeah. So why doesn't it? Well, you know, there's different proportions. If you look at the magazine, you'll see bigger margins on the left and right because the magazine's about 3-4 ratio, comic book more like 2-3. 
whenever you get to your nice, uh, you know, book edition on nice paper, there it is. Now you're getting the full bleed. So I don't know if that's a production issue or what the deal is, why it's like that. The thing is, some of these pages, they have the same sort of strange bleeding, uh, not bleeding, you know, built for the full bleed, but then reduced to a, a greater percentage than your other pages. So you do see all the edges. I can't answer that. Um, you know, the other thing to look at whenever you're looking at these, uh, this video is your comparison of how the color is produced on these different pages. I think it's the same color guides. They might be changing a couple of things, but you know, like if you look at say the nose highlight, it's, it's softened on both sides. You know, I think they're using the same guides. Yeah. They may be specking out some different color ink mixes, but interesting to see the difference between a newsprint and what the ink and the color ink does versus your, uh, you know, your better quality paper. This isn't quite Baxter. It's uncoated, but it, it is definitely a higher quality white paper that the white. ink is sitting on top that, of. And that's, and that's key because this is yellowish and, and just, you could see how all the colors just kind of pull together. It's the same old story. We, we've talked about that a million times. I do want to go through a few of these pages though, just because Jansen's art is phenomenal. Let's use this. Like this to me is the best uh, kind of version because he's drawn for color. So when you see the black and white, it's kind of, uh, there's, there's something missing there. I recently rewatched this stuff reminds me so much of Miller, like that uh -huh. hand. That's something that you would see in, you know, in, in a lot of Miller's work from, uh, you know, Dark Knight Returns to Sin City. And of course I fell in love with Miller first. But Miller and Jansen, the great team on Daredevil for all those years, uh, some of the stuff that I think I loved about Miller is actually Jansen. This is my first uh, Klaus Jansen comic. Like, oh, I, man. I, I picked wow. this up off the off the newsstand, man. I mean, this is the era, like, X-Force 1 is coming out, or, like, uh, um, De the Deadpool, I mean, yeah, Deadpool issues of New Mutants. Is, like, this is all so burnt into my brain, dude. It was like, I was in third grade, and this is the year where I'm full on buying comics, going to grow up to become a cartoonist. Like I had a couple other friends like, okay, I'll get all the X books. You get the Spider-Man books. Other dude would get the goth, like a uh, ghost rider punisher. He was the goth punisher. That's guy. pretty good. Like doing, doing the team up, having yeah. a couple other readers that you could really uh, make that work. I wanted to point this out. This is an effect of like the cop car, you know, screeching in reminds me a lot of Bernie Krigstein. I have a Bernie Krigstein comic that pretty much has this exact effect. I think it's 87th Precinct, an adaptation of a cop TV show, but it does that same kind of drawing effect. And I mean, they're both New Yorkers. It wouldn't surprise me if uh, Jansen knows this stuff. See, Jansen, he's of an older generation, man. Because like, if he was our age... Dude, that's that's Budnick from Camp Onawana. You know what I'm saying? That's that little redhead boy that who was uh, Arnold and Willis's friend. <laughs> wow. You know what I'm saying? And if it was like one of us, like we would have drew that kid properly. But Klaus is just like, oh, you got John Connor and his friend. Yeah. But you know, you dropped the ball, Klaus, a little bit. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's but here's what you say. Here's what you say, Klaus, because I know he's a kayfaber. He's out there. He's listening. Uh, that, Everyone is. That Danny Cooksey. The the you know Camp Budnick from Camp Onawana, he was also the voice of Montana Max. So this is what you say when fanboys come up to you, Klaus. Say why didn't you draw Budnick properly? You just say that you were drawing a human version of Montana Max, <laughs> and uh, from Tiny Toon Adventures. And Boy, that'll be a relief for him. I bet he gets that a lot. It might come up, man. Like <laughs> I saw this and I was a, a little bit appalled. I love Budnick. <laughs> You're not wrong, Ed. <laughs> I uh, I just rewatched Terminator 2 for the first time in about 25 years or something. And this adaptation is extremely faithful. It is. But Budnick aside. Yeah, yeah, Do we got a guy licking her face in in here? Oh, man. Because that was like probably the grossest that scene. That was super the, gross. I was surprised cool by that. Uh, we'll see. I, I can't remember if that part's in here. But my point of that is... Oh, by the way, look at the amount of panels that are going into this. It feels like classic. You know, it feels like when uh, when it's Kevin really when Kevin wild. Eastman is doing his pastiche on, on Miller Jansen. Like, that's this amount of panels. There's some really great... It's very dense, but there's some really great storytelling. But the fact that he's so close to the movie makes me wonder what he's working with. Because we would hear those stories about adaptations where it's like, we don't even know what this character looks like. You know, and here's another thing about the panel stuff. Uh, and, and I do bet he, he had access to plenty Look of the stuff. the drawing on that exploding rig. You know, the few jobs that I've done early in, in my career, circumscribed amount of pages, and you got to tell... 
a ridiculous amount of volume in that very circumscribed amount of pages. So he's making something work when he knows he has 66 pages or whatever to, to do, you know, a, a two hour movie. And depending on what he got, because there's th about maybe two or three versions of T2, like there's that long extended yeah. one that has like another 10 minutes or something. Uh, I don't know if that's this or not. Look, man, that's a real good Eddie Furlong, man. It is. Uh, worth looking at this color. There's so yeah. much gray that's used that is very atypical of comics uh, at this time. Christy Schill is the colorist on here, um, but you don't see these kind of palettes very often. And I think we're coming up on the part where she is licked. <laughs> <laughs> I think it must not happen. Right, Because yeah. I think it happens shortly before this. Yeah, because you've got to uh, clobber that cat. He do, Jansen does this like four panel piece over and over, like all throughout this first issue. But it's it's virtuoso drawing. He's doing a lot of hatching. I think it's a lot of pen work. There are screens being used. Stabbing weapons. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm super impressed. When I first bought it, it was basically just for the Jansen artwork. And as I got further into it, it's like... It's kind of exceptional, Jansen. Look how good that hand and thumb are. Yeah, yeah, that's he's referencing that out, man. And and it is the Speculator Boom Spider-Man 1 came out already. I was there. So we got to get McFarlane's name on this piece right here. This was my first McFarlane Hulk was that Ground Zero trade paperback. Oh, it's for that real? it's that cool picture of the Hulk like it's it's this is part of the cover. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I'm pushing the logo apart. Yeah, I had that had that issue when I was a little dude, man. That's with Eddie and Bobby in there. <laughs> um, I don't have issue two, so if uh, if you don't mind, we'll go to this. I'm going to say go to this black and white version rather than the uh, the prestige format. Maybe we'll do the, the third issue for it. But uh, this is where you continue on. I love this panel too. You know what's pretty really wild cool? uh, in the in the flick. Uh, you you bring this home. You watch it on your HD TV, and you see. A very old dude <laughs> hunched over so much to try to look like a slight little Eddie Furlong man. It's 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 a uh, it's shocking. Yeah, I bet. it's, it's like spaceballs. Like when oh, it's our stunt doubles. Like it it is a full grown man hunched over as much as he could possibly be to look super small against Arnold. That's hilarious. Look at how much white media is being used like on this screen tone for the sky where yeah. he's like painting in these edges of the clouds, the light, and then even down on the ground I think some of that is is white as opposed to, you know, like like reverse black or whatever. Right. I always wonder about his lettering sound effects because they look consistent across different books. Yeah, and it looks consistent with his penmanship. Let me see who the letterer is, man. Because like John Costanza would be like the Dark Knight letterer. Might be Jim Novak. Jim Novak. Um, but that's a that's a style. It's also noteworthy to me how good this looks in black and white. You know, he's doing full tonal range, uh, spotting blacks, doing all this hatching. We saw screen tone on that previous page, like. I, I mean, do you think he knew it was going to be printed a couple of different ways? Like, yeah, I, I doubt wonder. it. I, he's just, he's from, when you're from the old school, you ha the idea is you have to have strong black and white in order for the color to function. Like, that that was the golden rule, man. It's pretty fun seeing the the running. You know, like that character yeah. runs like a like a madman in the movie. Yeah, with his uh, hands out like this. You gotta, you gotta figure out, like, how do you put that in here? Pretty good to see. Schwarzenegger looks great. He does. Uh, you, you know, you talk about likenesses that don't work as well. You you got to know Schwarzenegger, and, and Jansen does that. So interesting too that uh, that Dark Horse is putting out other Terminator books. That was always confusing to me as a kid because I th I also think that now comics is making Terminator books around. Like so, it's like three different companies doing three yeah, Terminator. It's got to be. All three of those have to be published within five years, and maybe within like three years. Maybe even sooner. Yeah. All right. This is really great. This is cutting. Now we're back to issue three here, the way the stories are actually broke up. You get to see like those splash pages as your indicator. And I just think that that one's really strong. That's some, I don't know, man, that's taken liberties as far as drawing goes. Like, I don't think there's a shot like that in the movie, but I love the drawing. It's, it's just a such, a, such a cool foreshortening. Like, look how big the fingers are holding that gun out. Great textures uh, for the for the foliage and grass and stuff like that. You have to go nuts for that stuff. Like, like pen work will not do. It reminds me of, like, a Jorge Zafino. Sure, yeah. Which is pretty cool. You know, for Jansen's been around long enough that he has different stages and different tools that he uses, but I really like this version. Yeah. 
Dyson. <laughs> he should put that chocolate chip on Dyson's face, right? He has like a prominent mole somewhere. It's been a long time since I saw this. I mentioned the, uh, you know, what what was this created for? Like, does Jansen know it's going to be in color? Is he working for black and white? I even wonder, like, color-wise, because we saw all those grays and colors that are pretty atypical, but when you see them on this paper, you know, you get that full range. Like, on newsprint, these blues and grays and olive, that's all the same color. <laughs> but here it stands out. So I wonder if this was always the uh, what they had in mind, and then it was like, you know, do the newsstand version, and we can make make some money off of those. And then I'm curious, like, how many of these comic books were sold? So many, like, because the newsprint stuff or the newsstand stuff isn't always factored in. Like, there are certain sales outlets that they don't count. You know, you see the direct sales market, but I mean, this had to sell millions, right? At a time when X Men selling eight million, like T two was pretty high profile. There was on the spinner rack because I freaking remember it like yesterday. There was at least like the full rack of t of this issue, yeah. You know, like a, a full bunch in uh, and and that's and that's Rite Aid, so that's a chain. Yes, you know what I'm saying, man. Like uh, probably no different in any other Rite Aid that you you would go to, and like this this is the interesting stuff to me because it wasn't a foregone conclusion that 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 um, books would be uh, co- collected in some kind of trade. So the Trades that I knew about back then, it would be these weird. Th- it would be, um, I think the first trade I ever got was uh, G- a GI Joe special missions, and it just collected like the first four issues or something. It was like six, seven bucks, and it would just be random, you know, same white paper. So what I'm saying is, I think this this was. It's like let's take a couple of bites of the apple. Like yeah. we got this thing. We have a license. Uh, the language in the license is going to allow us to do a couple of more things. So like let's just. Give it, give it out, put it out there in every format. Yeah, I would be curious though, like what kind of deal, what what are these selling at? Is Jansen making a nice big fat royalty off of this? You would, I hope. You would hope so, because that's a great cover. You know, if you're if you're on the fence at all and you see that man, you could you could you could be buying this thing from from many feet away in the uh, you know not even a comics collector, but walking through the drugstore and see that on the rack. Blue, yellow, and red on the cover. Oh, yeah. Nice, good portrait. That arresting image of Arnold, like, unmistakable. I know now why you cry. That is something I can never do. <laughs> Time to lower you into the gimmicks, man. And oh, they, you know. they aren't wasting any time, or, or they're not wasting any anything, any resources, because the inside back cover is your last page. So talking to, like, you know, got to make this thing fit within 64 pages or something. Jimmy, Pittsburgh is a steel town, so I got a quick anecdote, man, from my steel mill working folks. Uh, it's just like, you know, the Springfield power plant, you know, like there's the, the, uh, X number of days since there was an injury or whatever, there was a guy and this would happen who fell into the vat of, of molten uh, steel. Yeah. It was a suicide. And, uh, what they do, they, they cool it down. They cracked it open. All that was left like a carbon bubble, no wow. skin or anything, man. Just a bubble of gas. That's really disturbing. <laughs> yeah. Thought I'd leave us with a little comparison there, the two images. But you know, you can totally see what I'm talking about with all of these grays and different colors. They just they just become muddy yeah. in the newsprint. Um, so maybe it was figured out for that for that nice prestige version. Maybe. That's your high ticket item too. You know, that's where Marvel's going to make the most of their money. Especially at this point, like I'm sure they sold so many of these that they were in clear in the black and in the right. profit. So all of this other stuff is just gravy. Biting the apple, man, a couple times. Awesome, super fun to look at, man. We've had these things collecting dust in the pool list for us to make a video. It's done. We made it happen, Jimmy. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to put this one under because as the film, we've looked at a lot of film adaptations and ones that stand out, and to me, this one stands out. This is a really pretty book to look at. Agreed, man. Jansen is a badass man with the pen and ink. Good. Just unbelievable what he can do. Good way to leave it. Okay, favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. What do you have out there, Jim? Join me on Patreon at patreon.com slash jimrug where you can find some of my out-of-print zines and mini-comics. You can see a lot of my original art and process, and right now you can see me comparing and contrasting Street Angel's Dog and Street Angel Lost Dog. Patreon.com slash jimrug. 
Red Room Comics are going to be out in the wild beginning uh, May 2021. You could reserve the first two issues through Fantagraphics right now. I have a link tree in the description below. Send you to the website to make that happen. But if you have a cool store to support, by all means, go to your shop, reserve your copy there, get it put on your pull list, have uh, a cool, solid, monthly, complete monthly comic. Uh, Patreon.com slash Ed is where you could read these comics ahead of time. Three bucks will get you the archive and you could uh, see what you're getting yourself into. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with everything that we have going on and coming out. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Jimmy, give him one more set of marching orders and we'll be out of here. Read more comics. Hasta la vista, baby.